I'm delighted that Sir Alan Wilson um, is with us this afternoon. Um, Sir Alan started with um, mathematics from Cambridge, but then converted to the social sciences through research on, on cities. I mean, he's an absolutely <laughs> prolific author as well, because he's published 17 books and over 250 um, papers. When I knew him many years ago, um, he was vice chancellor of the University of Leeds, and that was from 91 to 2004. Um, he was knighted for services to higher education in 2001. I think if you read his bio, you will be quite astonished at the honors that he has attracted. Um, he is now professor of urban and regional systems in the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at UCL. He is also chairman of the AHRC. Um, so, Alan, welcome, and up to you. Thank you. Well, th th thank you very much, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, after, after doing all these uh, jobs over the years, I've now uh, reverted to proper academic life so that I feel I'm uh, in good company, I hope, uh, today. Um, what I want to talk about is something very different, but I hope complementary to the previous sessions and pro probably to anything else that's on the programme. Um, I want to, in a sense, underline the science in the title of the seminar and talk about what uh, complexity science uh, and modelling uh, has to offer. Uh, Eve said in her introduction at the beginning that um, we needed quantitative tools and techniques to model co-evolutionary dynamics and, and that models were not fully exploited. Uh, what I want to do is to talk about uh, one branch of modelling, uh, which is really models of cities and regions, um, and to talk about uh, how they will say something about urban forms and then think about how to translate that into the kinds of urban forms that might be very different and might be energy efficient uh, in the future. So in one sense, uh, I'm talking about a research project which is yet to be done. Uh, what I want to do today is to say something about the history of modelling and what can be brought to bear uh, on, on, on the main topic uh, of this seminar, uh, to say something about some very exciting territory, I think, that I believe urban modelling has now reached. Uh, I'm going to finish up saying... Uh, try, trying to convince you that it's possible to talk about the DNA of cities and if you can talk about the DNA of different kinds of cities uh, then you can ask yourself what kind of genetic medicine will actually produce uh, the urban forms that might allow adaptation to climate change and different energy policies. So that's the ambition um, and, 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 and that's what I will try to do, but I emphasise that it's really a research programme, um, and I've just discovered, uh, talking to Tim Fox and Peter Allen, that at least three of us in the room have uh, newly announced research grants from the EPSRC Energy and Complexity Programme, uh, so we have a million pounds worth of that in UCL, uh, in CASA, and working with three other groups in UCL. Um, and a large chunk of that will be operationalising uh, what I'm talking about today uh, to translate it from a more traditional urban planning perspective to an energy policy perspective. So that's what the new grant will be about. But that's, in a sense, to be done uh, in the next three years. So uh, what's it about? Understanding form, function, evolution of cities... Um, obviously critical, um, cities are huge energy consumers. Um, we've heard lots of things this morning about uh, travel, etc., uh, etc. Et don't need to spell any of that out again. Where I think we are in modelling is, is that we now know a lot about how to model complex systems, um, I think urban modelling is actually in the vanguard of this. Um, I always like to think, uh, when I say I work on um, modelling of cities, uh, that compared to some other complex systems, like bi biological systems, for example, um, 
that they're, they're complex enough to be very interesting, but actually simple enough relative to some of these other systems uh, that we can actually make a lot of progress. And I think we're on the edge of making huge uh, progress. So uh, how, how can we move forward with this? So I'm talking about city systems. Um, we need a population model. We need an economic model. Uh, the population work, make use of services, the economy delivers jobs, products, services, and there are a huge number of interactions between all these elements, uh, the transport system, the communication system. We can talk about the structure, the statics of this. Um, using biological analogies, again, we can talk about the function and the physiology, how the system works. And then I'm interested in the slow changes in the structure of the system uh, and this is what will get me to uh, a concept of something like uh, DNA. I know today is about grand challenges in a particular context. Um, I think the modelling of urban development and the evolution of cities is actually one of the grand challenges uh, of science as we now see it and I think it fits very well into the complex science um, area. Um, and I said to somebody over coffee that um, complexity science has become a very fashionable label and it makes me realise that uh, Peter and Jeff and myself and others in the room have actually been working in complexity science for long before it was fashionable. But uh, anyway, happy to take advantage of that. So there's a history which I think is actually very important um, we're pretty good at interaction models. We're pretty good at comprehensive models which have a, a long history of uh, urban structure um, in, in terms of the basis of it. Population models, input-output models, I think are particularly interested in this context because uh, as long ago as the 1970s, um, I was certainly writing papers with, with Eric Cripps and, and, and later Sally McGill, who were actually putting energy flows into input-output models. Um, but I don't think that's been seriously carried forward. Um, and I think one of the challenges of this kind of modelling, at either a national level, a regional level, or an urban level, um, and this is, I think, the implication of what Eve was saying earlier, that a lot of the tools are there which haven't really been carried forward into the climate change and energy policy agenda. They have with many of the models that earlier speakers have been talking about, but in terms of uh, urban modelling, uh, there are challenges there. We can now model dynamics, and that's one of the things that I'm mainly going to talk about. Um, Eve mentioned agent-based modelling, all sorts of different styles can be added to this. Um, I think the information systems base has been revolutionised now. We've got fantastic data available, uh, fantastic visualisation methods for looking at the outputs of models, and I'll show you some of these uh, from my colleagues in UCL who are brilliant at this. Um, there's still a problem in actually integrating the economics of all this um, with, 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 with the kind of urban modelling that's represented in this history. Um, the e economic modelers still tend to be single-centred, which obviously cities and regions aren't. But I, again, I don't want to be sidetracked into that. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly important, and it came out a lot again uh, in um, the earlier talks today, is that from a modelling perspective, there are at least four layers. Um, we're obviously interested in the global system. Um, I'd quite like to see, it, in, again, in terms of input-output models, different levels of development, I'd quite like to see a 185-zone global model with 180-odd uh, countries, as it were. Um, regions within a nation, cities within a region, and, and intra-urban modelling. And demographic models and input-output models tend to dominate at the top end of this. Uh, the models that I'm mainly going to talk about are, are about urban structure and interaction within cities at the bottom end of that. So the principal sectors uh, I've really already noted, um, but if you think about them in an urban form context, 
uh, population model, where do people live, what sort of public services do they use, although the public-private distinction is becoming a bit more blurred. Um, private services, retail services in the broadest sense, um, and, and, and the, the physical structure, the capacity in the economy uh, that, that carries all this, uh, and government policy that actually supports uh, large chunks of it. And then if you put all that together in terms of spatial interaction, um, you can actually list uh, the main interactions. And again, it's all fairly obvious, you know, journey to work, journey to schools, hospitals, retail, etc. Um, and all of that can actually be modelled pretty well. Now, I'm not going to do any detailed mathematics, but um, I just wanted to say that all that then has to be translated into the main arrays that will enable you to describe a city. Um, and I want to at least just mention all this because it's going to be relevant to what I say about the DNA, DNA argument um, later. Um, in terms of complexity, um, two or three years ago I thought I would go back to... Uh, to trying to go back to first principles and say, if I really wanted to build a general comprehensive urban model, how many variables would I need? And I started defining all these arrays. Um, I defined the interaction variables that go with it. So you start to get huge arrays uh, because some of these things can themselves be lists. Um, and I came to the conclusion that you needed 10 to the 13 variables on a reasonable assumption uh, for a not huge city. Um, and of course you can't do that. Um, and I mentioned that because it actually demonstrates one of the challenges of actually modelling cities in detail, that what we're doing as modellers is, is, is actually making approximations, making judgments uh, about how to get that down to a, 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 a sensible number. Um, you can take all those variables and represent them in an input-output table. Um, I'm not going to go through... I'm not going to try and argue that uh, in any detail. I'll just put that in to emphasise the importance of it uh, and, and for picking out energy flows. Uh, you can look at the main interactions, population, housing... Um, public services, retail services, the economy, as it were, driving all this, um, and, and, and import-export models. So what I'm saying in terms of what's been achieved is, is that we can build the models of activities at locations, these interactions, and we can now say quite a lot about the change in infrastructure um, so that with these two, we're modelling what I call the physiology of cities, how they actually work, uh, and then we're talking about how the underlying structure changes. So I'm going to illustrate um, how far I think we've gotten this by using what, to me, uh, is always the simplest archetypal model, which is actually the retail model, um, but you've got to think back to the longer list of variables and, uh, and say that if I had more time, I would talk about how to build a comprehensive model with everything in. Um, but the retail model for me has become what uh, particular plants or uh, insects or whatever have become to biologists. You tend to have <coughs> biologists who spend a career working on one model and the, the retail model for me uh, is the one that illustrates the, uh, the key ideas which can then be generalised into everything else. But the point about the structural model and the point about any complex systems model is that they're non-linear. And indeed, one of the questions earlier today was about path dependence. But the characteristics of non-linear complex models is that if you're looking at equilibrium solutions or even thinking about how the system drives through time um, near to equilibrium or being driven towards equilibrium, uh, one of the problems is you have multiple solutions. Nonlinear equations don't have uh, s simple solutions. Second point is that what happens in the evolution of the system means that they are incredibly dependent on the initial conditions. Um, 
So the initial conditions will determine the evolutionary path of a system. These are very general statements about nonlinear models. And then the second thing is that, in, uh, the third thing rather, in terms of the paths of evolution, uh, you can have what the physicists would call phase transitions. Uh, so phase transitions, the classical physics ones, are uh, ice to water to steam. Um, what are phase transitions in terms of urban structure? And then that's going to lead to the really interesting questions about energy policy. Are there possible changes in energy policy, possible interventions, which will either bring about phase transitions which are desirable or will avoid phase transitions that are undesirable? Uh, and again, I'm just talking about urban structure now. I'm not talking about the whole... Um, problem that uh, w w was the subject of the earlier talks. And then the final point on here about forecasting capabilities of models um, is actually to underline the point that Peter Allen made in the earlier discussion um, <coughs> that perhaps in olden days, I mean, I'll just speak for myself, you know, one really thought that you could do, you could use models to predict um, the future quite a long way ahead. Uh, the kind of understanding that we have now uh, that I've just been describing means that you can't do that. Um, you know, you really are dependent on where you are, how the system evolves. Um, but that doesn't stop you exploring scenarios. And so different scenarios can be explored using the models, uh, but they're no longer to be thought of as simple forecasting tools. Uh, and, 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 and that's uh, quite interesting. But anyway, let me move on then to the retail model uh, as an example. Um, and it's, it's a more or less hypothetical model to explore these ideas, um, but it's actually using real data. It's aggregate data, so um, it, 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 it's, it's, not, it's not a detailed model. Um, but again, it shows the scale of the problem for one simple system. So the yellow areas are retail centres in London, columns proportional to the size, uh, the blue dots are residential areas, um, and there are something like 200-odd retail centres, there are 620-odd residential areas. So that means in interaction terms, you're dealing with a 200-odd by 600-odd matrix um, and remember that should be subdivided and then remember all the other submodels. But the wonders of, uh, of, of contemporary computing power uh, is that it's no longer a problem. It will run on desktops and so on. So I want to just say a little bit about the model, um, just so you can get an idea of what goes into it. For anybody who's interested, if you're not interested, this bit lasts about two minutes or less. Um, but we're actually modelling the flow from a residential area to a retail centre. You can't really see the black on blue, but that's... Uh, I'm, I'm calling that zone I, I'm calling this zone J. So it's a flow, SIJ. You've got a transport cost in there, uh, which is going to be critical to this. I'm sorry, I've defined them in black and white here. Um, so you can see you know, the basic variables turned into algebra... And then you get uh, a classic equation which goes back to the 1960s, possibly earlier, um, where you can model these flows in terms of the attractiveness of retail centres, amount of cash leaving a zone, and some function that says the further you travel, uh, the smaller the flow will be. Now, the parameter to note here, just in terms of, very, of a very simple view of what energy policy will do, and I'll show you in a couple of slides' time what it will do to urban structure, uh, is this beta parameter, because uh, if beta is very high, um, it means that people don't travel very far to retail centres. Uh, and, of course, what's happened historically is the beta parameter has decreased over time, which is actually what has brought about what was actually one phase transition. It's always my favourite example of a phase transition. Late 50s, early <coughs> 60s, shift from corner shop retail into supermarkets. Supermarkets suddenly appeared uh, almost out of nowhere. And in about a four or five year period, there were supermarkets everywhere for food retailing. And you can actually interpret that in this model 
as beta going through a critical point which represented a phase transition so that you had a shift from one kind of urban structure to another kind of urban structure. So that, that's the main point I wanted to make about that rather than any detail. Um, I put this slide in just because uh, I, I was once involved uh, in, in the... Uh, in the 80s and then for about 15 or 20 years with a company called GMAP uh, which actually applied these kinds of models um, for these kind of clients. Interesting, nearly all private sector clients. Very difficult to get the public sector interested in this. And I just threw that in to say that uh, the models that I'm talking about are not pie in the sky. They actually work. Uh, people want to use them and they can use them in their own context. But let me go back to the interesting thing about where we were, because the people who are using the models are using the models of interaction. Um, they're totting up the flows into centres um, or into particular kinds of shops, which is what retailers would want to know or banks would want to know. Um, what I'm now interested in is how you model the evolution <coughs> structure. And I had one variable... This WJ, I said, was the attractiveness of shopping centres. And for the purpose of illustration, I'm going to say that can be measured by size. So the bigger the retail centre, potentially the more attractive they are. More choice, economies of scale, so cheaper prices. You know, however you want to rationalise it. But again, I'm not too worried. You, you can refine that to make it work. Um, I just want to say size will allow me to illustrate the, the problem. Uh, and, and how to progress it. And what this is saying, which is a very simple hypothesis, is that the change from one time to another depends on the revenue minus the cost of running the centre. And basically all that is saying is that if it's profitable, it grows. If it's loss-making, it declines. So it's, it, it's as simple as that in terms of a hypothesis to test this. Um, you can actually find an equilibrium from this. If these two things are equal, then there's going to be no change. So that gives you an equilibrium. And it looks very neat if you do it like that. Um, if you go back and do all the substitutions, you get something that looks pretty horrible. Um, and again, the point of saying that is um, if you've got to solve this for urban structure, which in terms of retail structure is all the WJs, it's my 200-odd centres in London um, you know there's your horribly non-linear model multiple solutions, path dependence phase transitions uh, and, and, and simulate it so what I want to do is to show you what happens if you run that um, for London uh, and I couldn't resist putting in some of my uh, pretty diagrams that I can now uh, get in uh, UCL. These are produced by my research student, uh, Joel Dearden, so I'll give Joel all the credit for his ability to do this because uh, I can't begin to do it. Uh, but this takes the original plan that I showed, and this is just a way of showing the revenues into centres. Um, so this is actually just to show you that you can uh, generate pretty pictures from this. But it's actually more important than that because... Um, what you can do with modern visualisation capabilities is get an insight into what the models are saying that you can't achieve analytically. Um, and so while it looks good, it's actually much more important than that. Um, the, I, th I think the first one was actually flows from residential areas. So these are flows into a centre. Lots of information on there. Joel did enter these into a computer art competition in UCL but uh, I don't think they actually won. Um, now, what, what is more interesting? If you think back... I want, I want to start talking about phase transitions now. Each of these cells is the, 600, it's, it's the, it's the grid system for London, so uh, you can't see the detail, but it's the 200 retail centres, 600 uh, residential areas. And the axes are the two parameters of the model. So I talked about the beta parameter, which is ease of travel, relatively. The alpha parameter measures the importance of size to the consumer. It's the importance of retail size. Now, 
What this kind of structure enables you to do is to run the model for a very wide variety of parameter values so that we can actually look to see if and where the structure changes and in particular if there are any phase transitions. So the challenge is to take this grid and to look for phase transitions. Um, That's just zooming into a bit of the grid. What we then did is to plot in three dimensions on top of that something which measures the structure of the system. And uh, essentially we have, uh, again, what the physicists would call an order parameter. Um, And um, it's essentially measuring whether there's a small number of large centres or a large number of small centres. And what, what this then begins to show is there's an area where there's a pretty rapid change. So there's an area of these parameter values where there's a pretty rapid change. So how can we dig into that and look for it? Um, And we simply can almost automate this now. Start to look for the areas of the grid where you start to get these jumps. And you start to get jumps from polycentric systems to, in this case, single-centre systems. Nothing realistic about this. This is simply to demonstrate that from the models you can get phase transitions. Um, And, of course, part of the real empirical challenge is to find the real ones. Uh, It's been done for for, for the corner shop to supermarket transition. Um, But I think we can be fairly convinced that there are many other phase transitions and that others would come about through the kinds of changes in energy policy uh, that have been talked about. So uh, that's the phase transition in more detail. Now, I want to then move from that example to make what I call a big leap uh, on this side, the, the, this slide and, and, and begin to talk about uh, what urban DNA might look like and to go to the general rationale uh, of what I've been saying uh, about urban models uh, as models of, of, of a complex dynamic system. If I go back to all those variables I, descri- I, I defined at the beginning, population, housing, public services, retail services, the economy, land, things like house prices, cost of travel, government intervention in terms of tax. Those are actually huge arrays. Each of those are huge arrays, multidimensional arrays. Think of what I was saying about the 10 to 13 or whatever, uh, and some approximation of that. So it's a very big vector. Recall then what I said about path dependence, that the evolution of the system within the model is determined by the initial conditions. So if you think about the slowly moving bits of this, like the housing stock, where the schools are, where the retail centres are, where the hospitals are, um, the way a city is going to develop, you can do it for the transport network as well, the way the city is going to develop is going to depend on where it is now. Those are the initial conditions. And that's the sense in which the structural bits of this kind of vector you can interpret as something like the DNA of the system because that's going to determine, uh, A, what kind of city it is. So you can actually use it to distinguish between different kinds of cities in different parts of the world. You can get a typology of cities out of it. Um, But in particular, for any one city you can actually begin to determine the cone of development, the cone of possible developments on various assumptions. And then you can see whether there are any phase transitions lurking in that cone. So that's the research challenge, to build energy dependence into this and then to see what the development possibilities are from what I've called the current DNA. And then you can see the planning challenge in a different way is to say, how could you rerun the model having tinkered with the DNA, which is what planners do in effect through zoning and all the rest of it, uh, to either avoid a particular end state or to move towards one. And what might be particularly interesting is whether 
you can find the least costly interventions that would actually lead you towards a desirable state. So in terms of climate change, sustainability, energy policy, the research challenge is to take the model structures that I've been talking about and actually to make the energy policy parameters explicit in that structure. And typically that's what we haven't been doing. And I think what the range of EPSRC grants that we're all about to embark on uh, will enable at least those of us who are modelers to do Uh, is to take on that challenge. So we will now actually start to make it more explicit. I've shown how it would happen with the travel parameters. So if there was a huge increase in petrol prices, uh, that's equivalent to this beta parameter increasing fairly dramatically. If you put that into the urban structure model, that timeline, uh, then you would see the structure changing. Um, You may already be seeing it changing if you look at the story in the Sunday Times last week, was it, about the Westfield Centre uh, in West London. Um, You know, it has the time passed, as it were, for that kind of very large um, retail centre. Um, But anyway, that's that's a very minor example in, in, in terms of what we would be trying to do. And again, back to this distinction between physiology and structure, which are the fast dynamics and the slow dynamics. So going back to the start and summarising what we now have to do, um, at the moment one of the things we're doing in a UCL context is making sure that we can assemble a good database for London. So being in London, London seems to be a good laboratory for us. And so we're actually just trying to bash everything together uh, that will enable us to do that, build a GIS that will um, be be, be our modelling database. Um, And and then actually go through the kind of agenda that I've been talking about. Um, Make the models more realistic than the almost toy model that I've been using to illustrate the argument um, and, and, and then to look for the phase transitions and see what it implies uh, for, 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 for the big picture um, test that uh, we, 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 we have to carry out. Um, and that will enable us in principle um, to start to look for urban structures that it might be feasible to evolve to, and I think this is the point, Uh, it might be possible to design more energy efficient urban structures. How you actually get from where we are now, point A, to where you might like to be, point B, uh, is, is, is a major analytical challenge. I think that's the end of the story. Thank you very much, and I think a lot more questions. Okay, so over there first, and then... Right. So one, two, three. <laughs> Mohan Sodi, Cass Business School. Um, wouldn't it be very tempting to make general models that can be applied to any city and not... Uh, meaning you lose some of the detail, but you capture more of the general. Yeah, sure. No, no, that, that in principle can be done. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about London because it's where we happen to work. The, the model structures ought to apply anywhere. Um, and I mean anywhere. You can actually, you know, um, so you can cover the whole range from very underdeveloped areas to e- USA, UK, or whatever. Um, and, and in fact, not a lot of that has been done. I mean, most of the modelling has been done in, in Western economies. Um, I can think of examples in countries like Nigeria, but they're actually very unusual. But the same principles apply. And in fact, that, one, of, one of the reasons why I've been particularly interested in the layers argument, um, particularly in the context that we're talking about, um, 
And again, it's back to path dependence and initial conditions. Uh, and it's back to the equity argument that I think it was Stephen was talking about. Um, how you get from A to B, might, in a global sense, might well be constrained by uh, the, 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 the current economic positions of different countries. But that should, you know, the modelling should, in principle, handle that. Okay. And I think, yes. Um, Patrick Butemont from the Abarchi Partnership. I didn't get that in before, so I'll get that in there. Uh, partly a comment leading to a question, if I may. Um, I'm struck by the rather impoverished view of human existence that your model presents. There's nothing about entertainment, socialising, art you know, what actually makes existence. It's, it's, it sounds like you're describing the standard featureless shopping mall and nothing else. Um, that's not meant to be insulting. It's just recognising that that's how I view your model. Um, I mean, this book by Michael Thompson, Organising and Disorganising, is a really excellent book, and I would recommend it to you on your journey for complexity if you haven't read it, that gives a, a, a much richer view of the codependency among the different communities that would shape a city, and therefore um, the kind of complexity framework that looks at the precursors, the ge geography of city, the environment, the components and how they can interact, intent, the, the planning, and then what you can do dynamically to shape the behaviour of the city will give you a much richer I think, way of approaching the model. So that brings me to my question. Having come back from China and seen how the organic city structures um, are impervious to this kind of development and where that kind of development has been put in place as it is, where they're just raising whole villages, actually the nature of social life, of human existence changes. And so the question is, how do you deal with the different cultural aspects of development in the model? I mean, the, 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 the question is obviously related to your um, comment. Um, and I have to say, just in terms of uh, tr trying to put my own credentials on the table, I am the currently chairman of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I do actually believe passionately in what you've just said. Um, but in a sense, you know, thereby actually lies the, 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 the answer to the problem, that... Um, I mean, what I've been talking about, and I mean, it's no different from, as it were, the medical sciences. You know, what one's talking about is how to plan effectively an infrastructure on which we can live, if you like. Uh, and I'm not actually trying to say that anything I'm talking about uh, implies that it's all, you know, life is about shopping malls or whatever. Um, but... Given the richness of life, you know, that good sociologists or whoever will describe to us uh, and, and, and that we will all subscribe to, nonetheless, you can actually predict very accurately um, how people move around, what you need in terms of transport infrastructure, uh, what's a good school structure, do you need three tiers of hospitals on a hub and, stroke, uh, and spoke structure? And those are actually questions that deserve decent technical analysis. So I think the two things are complementary. OK, I've got Ben, Diana, Paul, no. Um, Theo. Theo, yes. <laughs> and then you, yes. Okay, Ben Ramlingham, uh, Head of Research and Development at ALNAP, which is a network of all of the major international humanitarian agencies which respond to disasters. So all the UN agencies, all the Red Cross, Red Crescent, NGOs, donor governments and developing country organisations as well. And I, I had um, two questions. One is um, we've been doing quite a lot of work on the food price rises and the crisis that food price, the global food price system is facing. One of the real challenges in that is um, modelling how the food price rises will affect urban centres in places like Nigeria or Bangladesh. And the ch one of the challenges is that um, there's, there's no real predictability about how urban, uh, rural to urban movements actually happen and how markets are then utilised by populations. And it seems to me that this, with this model, there's a, there's a way of actually starting to understand how food price rises could change behaviours within... Um, developing country urban settings and then to start looking at how aid agencies should be responding accordingly and I just wonder if you've engaged at that level and 
particularly going back to the point that you made that public sector organisations are less interested. I wonder if some of these crises are making them more interested. Uh, that's one question. The second question, I think, builds a little bit on Patrick's um, question, really, which is you seem to be seeing the agents within uh, cities as individuals that don't really relate to each other in any particular way. But obviously retail behaviours, all, all kinds of other behaviours, um, uh, are shaped by a local range of behaviours, by communal patterns, by trends within particular areas. And I think it's particularly important when you talk, talk about climate change and respond to energy um, options. And I just wonder how much you're going to start building in this idea of kind of communal relations between agents shaping their behaviours into future models. Well, let me take, take the, um, the, 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 the first question first. I mean, I think it's, it's almost undeveloped territory in modelling, but I think as with um, a lot of these kind of questions and models, if you can actually formulate the question as you'll formulate the question, you could actually build a model that would uh, respond to it. Um, and one of the people on the panel here is Steve Bishop, who's sitting back there, one of my colleagues from UCL. And uh, he and I, with Julian Hunt and some others in UCL, have actually been looking, for instance, at uh, you know, what amounts and the way you've just put the question to so disaster planning. Uh, you know, can cities get to a size um, where they actually can't cope with major contingencies? Um, and um, one of the things that we're looking at is the extent to which you can use this style of modelling to respond to that kind of question. Um, the food question, as you put it, um, you know, is actually almost more like a retail modelling problem, and, and one of the things that's fascinated me, but which um, I don't think anybody's ever worked on, would be to try to build models of markets, because markets are, in effect, retail centres that move around. And if you're in, a, in, in an economy uh, that has that kind of retail system, uh, then it offers a different kind of modelling challenge. Uh, but again, I go back to saying if you can formulate the question, in principle, you can actually, uh, you can, you, 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 you can actually build the model. Um, in terms of um, your, your second question, um, I mean, I think there are... I mean, you're absolutely right about the core of the models that I've been describing. In fact, the mathematics only works if you're actually talking about people who are not relating to each other uh, when they make the decisions about where to travel or, 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 or whatever. And if there is an interaction, I mean, if it's a communal adoption of some fashion, then you can handle it. Um, if it's a, a more basic interaction... Um, that, then it's harder. And I think that gets us into other modelling challenges. Uh, Eve mentioned on her list agent-based modelling. And one of agent-based modelling actually gives individuals rules which could actually uh, in, in include interaction with other kinds of agents. Um, one of the really nice modelling challenges for somebody to take on would be to say... And modelling's full of these challenges. What are the rules for an agent-based system that would produce the same answers in the models that I'm talking about? And then once you've understood that, you can refine these models in the direction that you're talking about. But, you know, a lot of these are challenges to be taken on. Yes. Now, I, I must say that Ben has um, put forward some very interesting challenges that you will find in your summary of all the challenges to do with Africa and Asia in particular. I did not include them in the presentation in challenges because it was primarily to do with climate change implications. So I would like to invite you to turn that round to an energy one and put it up next door, please. <laughs> Thank you. Diana. So my question is a bit technical in the sense that this... Um discrete multiplicative stochastic models such as Lotka-Volterra and generalized Lotka-Volterra, I would say you get anyways phase transitions in this kind of, of models, which is, which is nice, actually. My question is more how do you use this kind of modeling with the multi-level one? You know, when you think of twiddling and putting, like, normatively some energy options up there in, 
at a city level or region level or whatever. How do you connect that? Can you have a kind of multi-scale, I mean, techni- multi-level? Te- technically, it can be done, and it's why I always put in the layers argument. And what would happen if you had a modeling system that represented the kind of interactions you're talking about is the upper layers would constrain what's happening in the lower layers. And uh, Yeah. Well, it depends on what you think the relationships are. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm very conscious, uh, and, and it was partly implicit in some of the earlier presentations. Um, the, the danger is that modelling can be seen as playing games and not actually you know, get anywhere near reality, which is partly why I put the GMAP slide in, because you know, it does get near reality, at least for some kinds of application. The research challenge is how near to you know, a semblance of reality we can get for these new problems that we're actually talking about in modelling. And those of us who are modellers believe that we can. <laughs> but, uh, but it can be done in terms of layers and constraints. The well, order, Paul next, yes, yeah. it's Paul, then Theo, Eileen, and then mm-hmm. back there. Yeah, Paul Eakins, King's College again. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a bit about kind of showstoppers, and I'll explain what I mean in in a minute, and the way these models have been used to identify them. I mean, if if the sort of exam question for today is uh, how might one move towards a sustainable energy system, um, I'm I'm put in mind of uh, the chap who was asked, uh, how do you get to um, Birmingham? And he said, I wouldn't start from here. Um, And that's very often interpreted as being a rather unhelpful, if amusing, remark. But actually, he might have been deadly serious. He might have been, meaning in this modelling context, no, actually, if you're starting from here, you can't get to Birmingham, and therefore you better do something about that. And I can think of at least five reasons why we might not move to a low-carbon energy system, uh, of which one is obviously cheap fossil fuels, and that's one I spend quite a lot of my time in, and and that might be a showstopper. Yeah. And it might be yeah. that if we keep wanting cheap fossil fuels, yeah. we can't get there. And there are a whole heap yeah. of other ones, yeah. Uh, yeah. other kind of social factors. Yeah. To what extent can one model these kind of showstoppers in the sorts of contexts and the kinds of models that you've been working with? Well, I think that's a very interesting way of putting the question. And um, that's why I was trying to get at something like the DNA concept, because you could say for an existing city... Um, on the rules that you're modelling with, and you know, that begs the question as to whether the rules might change uh, in some way, um, what you can do is predict, as it were, a cone of possible development. And mm-hmm. if you're outside that cone, you can't get there, which is your point. Uh, and and I, think you could, I, think, I think that's possible. But, but, but I would then make a related point uh, in, in, in relation to your question, and it might have been worth me starting here. I mean, one one of the parts of my toolkit for looking at these kind of questions, um, which is uh, something I pinched from Britton Harris uh, very many years ago, is is that for any of these kind of questions, you've got three... you, You can break it down into three bits. What's your policy? How do you design or invent in some way to achieve that policy? And how do you do the analysis to work out whether it's going to work and what the impact is. And what one's doing with modelling is actually talking about the analysis. Um, What one's doing in trying to build scenarios of energy-efficient cities is talking about the design end. And then the policy questions, which are also part of this seminar, is what you have to do to get from A to B. And it's a very complex series of questions. And you know, I confess that what I've been talking about today is the analysis side of this. But you can actually formulate your question, I think, you know, within these terms. So you can do the cone of development idea um, and, and what's possible and you know, whether you can get to Birmingham or not. Um, and, 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 but, but you could also design an energy-efficient city. You know, in other words, you can design what you might like to have. Um, and I think typically there's not a huge connection between what designers do, which are the architect end of the planning profession, if I can put it that way, um, and, and what modelers are doing to actually predict feasibility. So there's, a, there's another challenge there. There's Theo next. Yes. Yes. I think you already answered my question, but I'm going to slightly... Theo, say who you are, please. Uh, yes, I'm <laughs> Theodor Zamenopoulos. I'm working for the Open University Design Group. Um, and I was before at the Center for Advanced Fossil Analysis, so I'm familiar with the place. Um, well, I tried to rephrase basically the question and say, 
how do we develop models that essentially link urban infrastructure with uh, uh, issues that are related with climate change and energy? And um, because there is a problem in the sense that I know that it's very difficult to understand how compact cities or sprawling cities may or may not have an impact in, uh, in the more general picture. And it, this, is, this question is also related with this multi-level, probably, uh, perspective of how we incorporate multi-levels in, in, in that model. Uh, so the, the question is essentially how do you see that this um, tradition of modeling can have an impact on, uh, on the integration between uh, these different perspectives of uh, modeling? No, it's, it's, it's a good question, and I should have said more about that. And, and in fact, we already have uh, research students in UCL who are working on some aspects of this problem. Um, there is some low-hanging fruit here, because if, if you can actually, as I am arguing, if you can predict spatial interaction and travel patterns pretty accurately, um, you, you, you can actually predict the CO2 consequences of that as a spatial pattern in cities and you can actually then say something about what kind of urban structure uh, delivers what kind of emission pattern um, for the city. Um, You can do that in terms of mode changes, you can do it in terms of spatial structure. Um, we were hearing in some of the earlier talks uh, about energy energy efficiency in housing. Um, I mean, the models that I've been talking about would actually build in the housing pattern of the city at a fairly fine level of spatial detail, different kinds of economic activity. You could actually make some reasonable guesstimates of energy consumption in different kinds of circumstances um, and, and you know, pr- pr- produce different kinds of heat maps of cities, CO2 emissions of cities, um, and then start to ask the questions about urban structure. So you can do the obvious things, um, and that's one of the things, you know, that's where we should start. But then there will be more difficult things that we should be taking on as well. But, uh, you know, my intuition says that that can be done, but it's a big challenge, it's a big problem. Eileen? Could you? Thank you. Eileen Conn, Living Systems Research. My question was going to be related to your slide on principle of spatial interactions. The thing that struck me about those was that they were either as Ben was saying, individuals to public authorities and such like, or corporate structures to corporate structures. And so my question was going to be about the people-to-people interactions, and I wasn't quite sure whether that was really rele- well, whether you might say that was irrelevant because of the way in which you were looking at spatial interactions, but I think it's been moved on very much, and I'm very interested in what Ben said, and I'd like to talk to him afterwards to see how what I'm interested in relates to that. What I'm working on in particular is the dynamics of individual interactions in urban neighbourhoods around their collective interests and how the dynamics and the organisational structures related to that are totally different from corporate structures. And yet, all the stuff that we're talking about today is the interaction between those neighbourhood organisational and behavioural dynamics, which goes to a completely different drum, as I would say, to to the corporate one, which everybody else, all the policies and all the rest of it, are are, are relating to those particular organisational and dynamic behavioural drums. And so that's the interaction interaction that I'm interested in, but I'm not a modeler at all. I'm a social, social services person, sociology, and so I have no idea whether that's at all relevant to your modeling and all the rest of it, but it's certainly relevant to the questions that Ben was relating, so if I can link them into that, maybe it'll link into the whole thing, but you may have some comments. No, I mean, there's a, big area, there's a big area of research that I haven't talked about, um, which is really about the modeling of social networks, and, mm. um, and, and so I think all, all I can do in the time we've got and indeed in terms of my knowledge of it is is to say that 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 is there and in many ways it's a different style of modelling it overlaps into the style of modelling uh, that I've been talking about Um, I don't want to make grand claims for what I've been talking about it doesn't do everything, it does what I've been talking about if you see what I mean Um, but you can actually use models in the territory that you're talking about now it raises interesting questions of course which, which is If you're talking about neighbourhoods and interactions within neighbourhoods, you're talking about a different scale um, to, say, social interactions on something like Facebook or MySpace. Again, there's a huge amount of research currently uh, on the development of social networks uh, on the internet. 
um, where you get into a totally different territory to what happens in physical space. And so some quite deep questions there then uh, about whether neighbourhood interaction is being overtaken by internet interaction. Well, I think it's actually all part of the same thing. And I just want to make the connection with your idea about DNA. I think it's absolutely critical to understand the DNA, all those other things that are happening now. And you're quite right to bring it in. But it's on top of what I'm talking Mm. about, not instead Mm. of it. I mean, for for anybody who's interested in this technically, I mean, there's one aspect of it which has interested me and that is there's a huge research industry on network theory and a lot of it is on is on social networks uh, and for some reason or other the vast bulk of it counts links and it doesn't actually count flows on links and there's a, again I suspect there's some low hanging fruit on how you actually put interaction flows onto the links that the network theorists uh, I've actually tried to write about that, but nobody takes any notice. It's, it's very interesting how fashions develop, and you know, you get research schools which could learn from each other, but That's which right. don't don't come together. Absolutely. Ben, is that the immediate response? Yeah, just, uh, one Can of the reasons for the papers on links. One of the reasons for the papers on links is most of it's been funded by the US intelligence. So what they're trying to do is map terrorist networks and identify how different groups are linked towards each other. Mm-hmm. By the way, it's one of the major factors of Facebook. We're getting into interesting territory now. All right, if we left the uh, terrorism, I'll go into uh, innovation because I'm in the Department of Management here at the LSE doing my PhD. And I look especially on um, technologies and how they emerge. And uh, I have a project, potential project, with uh, representatives from Korea. And uh, as you might know, they build new cities over there. The biggest project is a city that is planned to be fully built out in 2030 with half a million people. And I was there in October, and it's right now just a field of, field of grass. Um, so from that perspective, um, uh, when the Koreans are very much looking at what we're doing in Europe and uh, looking up to our longer research tradition, um, in the perspective of building these new cities that they do, um, my first question is how do you see that we can use technologies to gather the data because the model is fine but you you need the actual flows to make it realistic how do you see for example in london we have a particular situation here with oyster card tracking um we have the um congestion charge zones etc so that's my first question how you see uh, that being a help for these new developing cities in, in asia uh, that I would say in the Korean context are not these sprawling cities. They're very much planned, uh, centrally planned cities. And secondly, uh, and that might be just a, a difficult question maybe, but these tipping points and phase shifts that you mentioned, is that something that could be um, integrated in, in our way of in management when we look at emerging technologies? Is that something you could model or um, somehow take into your... Um, I mean, I mean, let me so tell you, the, 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 the last question first. I mean, emerging technologies, um, you know, is, is yet another reason why forecasting is almost impossible. Um, and, you know, you don't have to go back very far to, uh, you know, if you look at something like the Internet revolution, as it were, in terms of what that's done to uh, activities that we ought to be modelling if we're being comprehensive, uh, you can see how unpredictable it would have been 20 years ago. Um, so one's always up against that um, and there's some interesting modelling questions about basic technology which, which you can represent in terms of you know, for things you know about um, you know, production functions, costs what are the areas where costs might get cheaper if costs get cheaper, what happens to structure and so on so you can answer some of the questions um, but, but some of it of course will be wholly unpredictable but a couple of comments on, on your other two questions. Again, I'll take them in, in reverse order. Um, if you're planning a new city, I go back to my policy design analysis, you can actually have a policy to be energy efficient, which might be, take one very simple example, it might be in terms of public transport rather than car use and some kind of efficient public transport system. Um, and in terms of phase transitions... Um, and the kind of structure that will allow you to have a public transport-based system. Um, It will say something about urban densities. Um, And so if you look at some Swedish cities or suburbs of Stockholm where you've actually got um, 
high density developments built around transport hubs, you know, then you can actually run a public transport system. Uh, one of the things that's always struck me about British cities and, uh, and, and, and transport policy in this country is that we continually have exhortations for more use of public transport and less car use. Um, and, and in fact, I think the DNA model would actually show that it's impossible with the densities that we've got. Um, and you can actually chart that out. And so, you know, if you've got a chance to work on a new city, you can have different objectives and you can answer uh, the question. And then back to your first question, which is uh, an incredibly interesting one. Um, you know, 1984 and Big Brother lives. Um, I mean, I'm actually told that uh, even if the mobile phone in your pocket is switched off, uh, your company knows where you are. Um, and uh, if that is the case, then uh, the notion that in order to calibrate these models, you have to do large, expensive surveys where people stop cars and ask you where you come from and where you're going to, which is how it used to be done, um, you know, is now almost certainly not ne- necessary. You know, without going to the mobile phone companies, um, you know, you can get enough data uh, from the kind of sources that you've mentioned. Um, not to mention satellite data and so on, which would actually give you traffic counts on roads. And one of the modelling challenges is how to integrate what you could, as it were, legitimately get. And again, I think that's all to play for. I don't think that's been done yet. And, um, you know, there are, there are obviously some real freedom of information issues there and some real privacy issues um, in all that. Um, and we're in very complicated territory. But, but there's more data um, than we can easily get our hands on. I would then know what to do with if we had it. One of the things about modelling, by the way, uh, is that you don't need a lot of data to calibrate these models. You don't need comprehensive surveys. Um, that's by the way. Thank you. Could you pass the... I just want to comment briefly. Oh, that, yeah, very uh, brief. In the last, yes, very briefly. That in the last business week, two or three weeks ago, there was in San Francisco and New York, there's a company that has managed to get the data from all the mobile operators. And obviously each user is anonymized, but they seem to have that data in some cities now. But uh, what they will come up with from that data, who knows? <laughs> no, that way, please. That gentleman at the back there. Then I have Peter and then Stephen. Was there anyone else I... Who my uh, Tao Zhang uh, from the Judge Business School, Cambridge. Uh, I've got uh, two questions. The first question uh, is about the um, uh, incorporating uh, energy policy into uh, city modeling. So how can you um, formalize the, en- uh, the um, uh, policy scenarios in the modeling process? And uh, my second question uh, is related to uh, model validation. So... Um, um, how can you effectively um, uh, validate the simulation results and uh, make sure the results are stable? Um, as I note, uh, when talking about simulation models, a lot of, res- uh, a lot of researchers are questioning about the trustability and the uh, stability of the simulation results. Thank you. I mean, on the first question, I don't think I can really add to what I said to Theo uh, earlier, that uh, I think there are ways of adding to the existing models um, in terms of energy outputs. Um, and then you have to go back to the policy design analysis framework and say, what are you actually changing in policy terms? And then work out what that implies for the, 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 the parameters in your model. So it's not easy, but I think in principle... Um, that can be done. In terms of model validation, um, if you're working with something like spatial interaction models, um, you can, uh, you know, the, the, the validation is, is, is not that difficult. Um, if you're working with models of structural change, then the question of stability um, that, that you are talking about obviously lurks there, and I think you can only deal with that um, by something like sensitivity analysis uh, to see whether there are any instabilities lurking in the kind of territories that you're trying to forecast in. In terms of spatial interaction, some simple uses. I mean, if you're planning school systems or hospital systems or something like that, you don't have to be a long-term forecaster to optimise the use of the technology to deliver the best service to the population. 
Um, I think David mentioned OR earlier. It's, it's a classic OR problem, and, and it's solvable um, in, in, in those terms. And I remember, you know, back in my GMAP days, when retailers who we were working for would ask the same question. And um, there was one famous case where we said... Um, and, and the, the company was actually trying to do this kind of modelling themselves, but were not really succeeding. And they wanted to predict flows into new stores. And so we said, right, give, give us half your data for a region and in terms of revenues in stores, and we'll predict the other half. And if we get that right, you know, perhaps you'll be convinced. And we did get it right. And their own people couldn't get it right. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a good way to get a contract. But you can do these kind of tests. But you're doing it for the existing situation. And you're quite right. As soon as you start forecasting, um, you're in trouble. So there are problems that are amenable to short-run forecasting, for which it's fine. If you're into long-run forecasting, which is mainly the subject of this seminar, then you're into sensitivity analysis and looking for phase transitions and so on. Peter? Uh, yes. Um, the uh, Many years ago... <laughs> We used to argue possibly about equilibrium or dynamic and such things. But uh, in thinking about the energy policy use, um, one of the things that's very true, and you separated out physiology from structure, yeah, and that, that's very, very significant because I think that you will be faced in trying to explore cones of development with the fact that... Um, Built, built environment doesn't change that fast. I mean, if we take the oh, climate, sure, sure, climate change sure, issue, um, sure. you know, the turnover is very mm. small. So mm. I think maybe you'll, you'd have to combine, if you like, the cost of the change in built environment yeah, required for your thing yeah, as I against agree with that. Yeah, I agree with changing that. the physiology. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think Steve wanted to my name is Stephen Bishop. I'm from UCL, but I think two of my questions or points have been raised. One of them is about the data you require to validate your model, why you did commercial properties or commercial adventures rather than social interactions was because they paid you to and they provided you the data. Right? So, you know, modelers can do that if you have the right data. We can answer that question before yeah. you go on to the second one. Um, I mean, the, in, in, in GMAP terms, and, you know, that kind of business obviously still goes on, you know, uh, internationally. I mean, lots of people do it. Um, companies do it because they can almost immediately uh, improve their profit level. And it's, it's actually as simple as that. Um, so the demand is there. Um, and even then, I mean, you get the kind of company manager who will stick his finger in the air and say, I don't need the likes of you, you know, I can tell where's a good site, I know where to locate all my branches um, and, and you know, they'll, they'll go their own way um, and, and the point I want to make is it, it does need I'm trying to find a, think of a polite way of putting this, it needs an intelligent customer as it were um, to respond to this kind of analysis uh, or it, it, it's, I'm not being wholly fair in putting it that way um, and the problem is in the public sector um, people haven't wanted to know. And I think that's a near scandal, and I've been arguing that for the last 30 years. Um, and I think it's still true, actually. They also very clearly define what they want, whereas in the, these public sector arguments, there are so many different mm. things come into the arguments, whereas yeah. for them it's footfall yeah. or yeah. Um, profit cost. But, but, but I'll, give you, I'll give you another very simple example, uh, which, which, which is a topical one. Um, the government argues, and it's, it's been because of the school admissions thing, it's been in the news in the last month or so, um, you know, how many parents get the school of choice for their kids. Um, and the answer was about 80% or 70%, but, you know, uh, varied tr tremendously locally. Um, it would be possible to analyse what you had to do to have a school system that increased that degree of choice. Um, but nobody does it. What you actually have is a fairly complicated rule book, but it doesn't actually optimise the outcome. So, I mean, there are loads of territories where modelling, I think, could have an impact and could actually improve the situation. And again, we're, we're moving away from energy policy 
Eve, but uh, the same considerations apply. My second point was raised slightly by Peter as well. In it's to do with the time scale involved. Phase transitions may be seen as good or bad, depending on whether you want them, but they're often seen as very rapid. That's why we call them phase transitions, because they're very rapid. But it's very difficult in the modeling approach actually to, to calibrate the time scale of some things. That is, a, in modeling terms, sometimes quite tricky yes, to do. No, I yes. agree. I agree. Okay. Ben, did you have a comment rather than a question? And then back, and then now for the last just a, one. Just a comment on Peter's point, really, which was about um, the structures don't change very quickly. I mean, I guess there's an assumption underlying that this kind of modelling is going to be used for mitigation strategies rather than adaptation strategies. Where, we, where most of our member agencies work, it's already too late. We're already dealing with an international humanitarian system that's pushed to the breaking point because we can't respond to the number of climate-related disasters that are already happening. So actually, adaptation is the way forward. And there's some remarkable examples of adaptation that have taken place in the last couple of years where vulnerability has been reduced enormously. Bangladesh, two years ago, where a massive cyclone of the same proportions that killed 240,000 people in 1991 only killed 3,000 people. That's still a huge number of people to die, but that was down to adaptation strategies. And essentially, men on bicycles with my- megaphones <laughs> cycling around at certain points. And, and I think, that, I, think the, the, I guess it's a plea, really, that the, mod- the modelling capacities that are being used around climate change, around energy policies, aren't just focused on the northern rich countries, but also look at the capacities for adaptation at the national uh, levels within uh, city levels within developing countries, and relating specifically to Peter's point, informal settlements uh, where so many, so much of the growth in urban living at the moment is in informal settlements in developing countries, and they do change dramatically very quickly. Sure. Um, okay, thank you. If you pass it along to Noah, please, and that's the last question. For- Thanks very much. Um, Noah Rafford, I work with Eve at the LSE Complexity Program, among other things. You, related to Ben's point, you dropped a very interesting phrase about halfway through your presentation about some research that you're involved with, I believe, with a colleague at UCL about this question of are cities too big to adapt? Is there some point where in which we have already gone down the path and we're already quite locked in there? So I was wondering if you just might be able to elaborate a bit more on on what that research looks like and if you have any findings and with regards to climate change and energy, if indeed some of our cities or some of our structures are already committed to unsustainable patterns, what then might the implications for planning and design be? I mean, again, it's a research project to be done. Um, I mean, the kinds of, uh, I I mean, I'll say small scale, although it wasn't small scale um, in in another very obvious sense. example was something like the post-Katrina uh, flood in, in uh, New Orleans. And in fact, I've been doing quite a lot of work in New Orleans uh, in, in, in the last two years. Um, and the kind of issue that raises, that, that's raised there is if New Orleans had been 10 times the size, um, you know, could people have got out in the way that they actually did get out of New Orleans? You know, so, I mean, it's that kind of question. And then you can actually think of the range of disasters that might strike. Uh, some of which will be climate change, energy policy related. Um, and um, I mean, there have been, uh, in, in, in terms of energy policy, uh, you know, where do you put your power plants in such a way that, um, you know, floods won't knock them out? I mean, there's a near example in this country recently where uh, floods might, you know, just didn't knock out an absolutely crucial uh, power plant. Um, it's all that kind of question, and again, you can model it. Steve, Steve have you got other examples? I can respond very quickly. If yeah. you ask a water resource person, they'll tell you it's the water resources that will see the end of it. The health person will say the hospitals won't be able to cope. Yeah. All right. You ask the transport people, they'll say it's the transport that will break down. Okay, so at the moment, we have no consensus quite on which one is going to be the, the weightiest. <laughs> okay. And on that note, (laughs) I think we'll finish for this morning. And thanks, Sir Alan, very much indeed. Okay, may I ask you to be back for 2 o'clock, please? Lunch is next door. And please take the opportunity to put your names down for the small group 
groups that you want to join for the discussion on projects. And if you don't like the ones that are already up there, take a new sheet and write your own on it and put it alongside. Um, so let's populate those um, um, uh, project uh, ideas next door and see you all at two o'clock. Anyway, lunch next door. Thank you.